Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Scott Hershevitz to celebrate the launch of his book, Nasty, Brutish, and Short Adventures in Philosophy with My Kids, and in conversation this evening with Ibu Patel. Just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed this evening. Uh, you can keep the chat window open because I'll be sharing links to purchase the book throughout the event there in the chat. And Q&A is available to you uh, to interact with at any time. Um, whenever you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to submit your question using the Q&A. And live transcription is also available uh, if you need closed captioning this evening, there's a CC icon on your toolbar as well. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. And right in the lower uh, right-hand side of the video, you'll see a little typewriter where you can click and subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with literati events when they become available there and as a reminder you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the united states and if you live in southeast michigan uh, our doors are open to the public for in-store sh shopping we do have signed copies of nasty brutish in short while they last in the store and most of all, we'd like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning uh, or this afternoon or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. But without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Scott Hershevitz is director of the Law and Ethics Program and a professor of law and philosophy at the University of Michigan. He holds a BA in philosophy and politics from the University of Georgia, a JD from Yale, Yale Law School, and a DPhil from the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. Professor Hershevitz served as law clerk for Justice, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the US Supreme Court. He's married to Julie Kaplan, a social worker whom he met at summer camp. They live in Ann Arbor with their two children, Rex and Hank. Joining him, Ibu Patel has worked with governments, social sector organizations, and college and university campuses to help make interfaith cooperation a social norm. Named by US News and World Report as one of America's best leaders, Ibu served on President Obama's inaugural Faith Council, and is the author of Acts of Faith, Sacred Ground, Interfaith Leadership, A Primer, and Out of Many Faiths, Religious Diversity, and the American Promise. He holds a doctorate in sociology of religion from Oxford University, where he studied on a Rhodes Scholarship. Please join me in welcoming Scott Hershevitz and Ibu Patel into your living rooms. Man, this is going to be fun. Uh, so I've been arguing with Scott Hershevitz for what is it, 25 years? Something like that. Uh, yeah, well, learning from, uh, uh, having my eyes opened by, et cetera, et cetera. Scott and I actually wrote parts of our books together in the same small town on the border of Michigan in Indiana. And I've loved reading this. I've loved reading this. And uh, I have to just comment that you have for 25 years been my super smart philosopher friend. You have not always had the awesome heavy metal guitarist hairdo. And I didn't know that somebody could pull both of them off, but here you are being both. And so if Patrick Hayden, I know you're on and maybe Mary you're on and some, some old Oxford friends and you're like, boy, this is like, and this is the, the intellect is the same, but the grooming is different. Maybe we can thank you a better half, better half for that. I'm not sure that I am pulling it off, but the pandemic has definitely changed me. Right. So look, this is, Scott, thank you for this book. Like in, in all seriousness, as somebody who, who um, like values thinking clearly, as somebody who's learned from you an awful lot about thinking clearly, and as somebody who's a parent um, who doesn't always know what to do with my kids' questions, you have helped us think clearly about what to do with kids' questions and actually think clearly about lots of important things. And we're gonna get into the substance of several of those things in a minute here. Uh, uh, but I want to just begin with, what's the origin story of this book? Like in what conversation were you having with Rex and, or Hank or Julie? Uh, uh, and you were like, that is, that's so interesting. And this isn't just like a normal 6 p.m., you know, bathtub time where you are looking at your phone, of course, just like every normal human being, except for Julie, who is a special human being. Uh, this is a book. This is a book. So the origin story comes in stages. I think um, not all that long after we had Rex, who's um, 
the, the older of our kids, when he was maybe one or two, I started to, to realize I was talking about him a lot as I was teaching. So if we were having a conversation about uh, punishment in one of my philosophy of law classes, I might just start the hour, not by talking about the philosophers that we read, but by telling a story about something that Rex and later Hank had done um, and asking my class, well, what do you think we ought, what do you think we ought to do about that? And that would be a way of getting a conversation going about the purposes of punishment that the students in the class found immediately accessible and engaging. People like to talk about kids and the crazy things that they do. And the room would come alive in a way that it sometimes wouldn't if I started right away with, um, let's talk about um, some, uh, some old fusty philosopher. So, uh, you know, uh, and it wasn't just punishment, you know, sometimes when I was teaching about authority, I talk about the ways in which my kids challenge my authority, you know, all the time, uh, they would tell me, you're not the boss of me. And so I started asking my classes, you know, like, what is it that I should say back? Are they right? Or, you know, is there a reason to think that I have the right to boss them around? And, uh, you know, I think just without even realizing it, I just started doing this in a lot of contexts, even doing it with my colleagues. And then the second stage of the origin story of the book was I was giving an academic talk and I was just having trouble getting the philosophers, the professional philosophers in the room to see what the issue was that I was trying to raise about law. And I found myself telling a story about Hank and the arguments we've had in our house about what you have to eat at dinner, whether you have to try all the food that you're served. And so I started telling my philosophy colleagues about those arguments and instantly they all saw the issue. So it wasn't just something that was working for my students, it was working for professional philosophers too. And then I just got really lucky um, sitting at that table was a friend of mine, Aaron James, who is also a philosopher who's um, written for a popular audience, wrote a really terrific book years ago, years ago called Assholes, A Theory, asking what, what an asshole is and why assholes bother us so much. And he and I had just been having a conversation about how that book came to be. And when he heard me, this, heard me tell this story about Hank, he leaned across the table and he said, that's your book, write that. And so it was really um, a little bit of an assist from Aaron that made me think, oh, this thing that I've been doing with my students and been doing in conversation with my colleagues, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's something that would be helpful to a broader audience and especially to people who spend time with kids. That is a great three-layer cake. Students, other philosophers, and then uh, author friend. That's a great th three-layer cake. Ma it makes perfect sense to me. Um, so the book is the book is broken up into like classic philosophy sections, right? Morality, God, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Walk us through one of them. Like choose choose one, and yeah. what's the opening story, and what what are the like philosophical principles you illuminate? Walk us through yeah. one. So I'm actually going to pick a chapter that people don't tend to ask me about very often because it's not one of you know it's not God or rights or punishment. It's not something I think that people um, naturally gravitate to as a philosophical topic. But I think it does a really good job illustrating the themes of the book. I want to talk about the chapter on infinity, which starts with a story. Um, Rex and I were walking home from school one day when he was in second grade. And he says to me, uh, just declares that the universe is infinite, which is, you know, possible. But as I, I told him, I said, I, well, I don't know, actually, I think scientists disagree about that. Some think it's infinite and some think it's really, really big, but finite and we can't tell yet. And he says, no, 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 the universe has to be infinite. And, and then he made an argument and his argument went like this. He said, if you, if you took a spaceship all the way to the end of the universe, you're right there and you're right at the edge and you kind of punch at the edge, well, what's gonna happen to your hand? It's gotta go somewhere, right? And I said, well, what if, what if it just stops? And he says, if it stops, then something stopped it. So you didn't really get to the edge yet. And I, I thought it was a cool argument. I knew immediately that like the argument doesn't actually work. And when we got home, I pulled out a balloon, right? Because it turns out you can have a finite space that doesn't have edges like he was imagining. So we pulled out a balloon and I showed him like, you know, imagine you're an ant walking on the balloon and you just keep walking in the same direction. Are you ever gonna hit an edge? No, you're not because it folds back on itself. You can go around in a circle. And some scientists think that's how the universe works that space may fold back on itself. But I was, I was really struck by this argument and uh, and the sophistication of it for a seven-year-old 
And I was um, at a party a few days later uh, telling a philosophy colleague of mine, Gordon Balat, Rex's argument. And he said, oh, wow, that's a famous argument, right? Um, it's been made throughout, it goes back to antiquity. It's been made throughout history. It was uh, originated by a Greek philosopher named Archytas, or at least it's thought to be. Um, as I say in the book, some seven-year-old probably thought of it first, but um, it was made by Archytas. It was made by the Roman poet and philosopher Lucretius. Even Isaac Newton was taken with a version of this argument. And so um, I think it's an illustration of a couple of points that I want to make um, through the book. One is that like kids are really puzzled by the world and they're trying to think it through, sometimes often on their own, and they think in really sophisticated ways. And I actually don't think it's an accident that Rex hit on this argument from an ancient Greek philosopher. I think if you don't know a lot of science and you're just trying to think through the world, you might come up with something that um, an ancient philosopher uh, came up with as well. So, um, so I think of that opening story as a kind of um, really good encapsulation of the skill that, of the curiosity that kids have and the skill that kids have that I think a lot of parents aren't, uh, aren't keyed into and aren't noticing and aren't encouraging. From there, but right, I won't wind you through the whole chapter, I just wanna skip ahead to the end, which maybe um, illustrates a, kind of, a second kind of agenda that I've- For the uh, record here, Scott, I just wanna say, I read this and I thought it encapsulated the argument of the book really, really well also. So, so I, di I didn't, I don't know why, if people don't talk about this, of course, the book has been out for two days. So maybe, maybe this will be the thing, but, but I thought it, you know, I thought it, it, it was the, it was the story that told the story as well. That's terrific. So um, at the end of the chapter, uh, you know, there's a, a fair bit that happens in the middle, but at the end of the chapter, I'm just sort of thinking through the size of the universe and the significance of the size of the universe and really the possibility that the size of the universe suggests that we're not very significant at all. That, um, you know, uh, and, and I talk about a picture book that I would read to my kids because I wanted this to be a, something that they would think about. So there's this picture book called 100 Million Billion Stars, um, which is a really, it's by Seth Fisherman, it's a really wonderful book for conveying the scale of the earth. It talks about the number of people on the earth, the number of ants on the earth. I think it talks about the number of trees on the earth, but then it like kind of blows up and communicates like the size of the universe in stages. Um, and it may actually even underestimate things. By some estimates, there's like a septillion stars in the observable universe. And if it turns out the universe is infinite, right, then maybe just an infinite number of stars. And as I say, like, I want my kids to, um, like, to be in touch with this, partly because it's just like an awesome fact about the world that we live in, but partly because I want them to ponder their smallness. Um, you know, we're here, like occupying a very small patch of the universe for a very short time. And, uh, you know, I talk a little bit about um, a philosopher, Thomas Nagel, um, who thought that there's a kind of absurdity in our lives. That if you think about things from the perspective of the universe, we seem awfully insignificant. We're not at the center of the universe. We don't seem to be in a particular uh, important bit of it. There's nothing special about the time that we're here. It just doesn't seem like we matter much in the big picture. But of course, um, in your everyday life, things matter to you a lot. They matter to us a lot. And, um, and he thought there's this kind of the juxtaposition of these two attitudes that maybe we're insignificant, but things are very significant to us, lends life a kind of absurdity. So I want my kids to, to think about questions like that. And then the last bit of the book, um, I think I actually I peeked at the participant list and I saw that Sarah Buss might be here with us. The last bit of the book, the uh, last bit of the chapter, is, is thinking through a set of observations that, um, that Sarah's made and um, uh, thinking through like, what moral courage consists in, which maybe is an odd topic to connect up to infinity. But uh, in Sarah's writings about, um, about moral courage, she suggests that there's a kind of trick that lots of people ha that have moral courage, that are willing to put their lives on the line for things that are important and sacrifice themselves um, for others. She thinks there's a, a kind of um, uh, approach they have to the world, which involves seeing themselves as the universe might, thinking of themselves as fairly insignificant in the course of their own lives as fairly insignificant, but nevertheless, letting others loom large, treating other people as if they matter a lot. And I think that's a really beautiful way to think about the world and a way that I want to encourage 
my kids to see the world. So, um, you know, I'm thrilled there's a couple of people from the IFYC Interfaith America Network who've joined. Uh, my friend Frank Fredericks and my friend Abdul Malik Ryan. I'm thrilled about that because they, they ask these kinds of questions also. And, you know, we deal with religion, religious diversity, philosophy issues. And this is like very much a part of the process that we encourage. So listen, now let me ask you a, a, a parenting question real quick. So yeah, I can imagine people being like, man, like dude is tenured at Michigan. Like he's written all these fancy books. Plus he's this ideal parent who like sits up for hours with his kids, probably like gives, gives them kosher s'more, s'mores and is like talking Socrates and Aristotle. So I, I have a, a friend acquaintance named Adam Mansbeck who wrote the book, Go to F to Sleep. Yeah. So how do you balance like, you know, oh, you like know let's, be, let's be Aristotle together with I man, think, go, go the F to sleep. I think my, uh, my wife and kids are downstairs watching this and rolling their eyes at the thought that, I, that I'm anything approaching, <laughs> uh, approaching perfection. They frequently remind me that that's, uh, that that's not true. And... Um, uh, you know, I, I think I want to say two things about that. One is, um, you know, there's this line in the book where I say, you shouldn't imagine, say, that when Rex and I are talking about God, that we're sitting by the fire and sifting brandy and talking for hours about life's mysteries. That's not how these go. Like these conversations are often just a couple minutes long, right? They're just, um, you know, brief flashes of curiosity, right? The moment when the four-year-old wonders, wonders if he's dreaming his entire life, and you may get to have two or three minutes of conversation about that before they're on to the next thing that they're thinking about or curious about, or they're just running off to play. Um, but as I also say, like these conversations add up over time, especially if you come back to them, right? When you're putting a kid to bed and you're quiet and you bring back up, right? That possibility that, oh, maybe you are dreaming your entire life. And how do you know whether you're going to sleep or you're waking up right now? So I think if you pick up on those moments and you return to them, you can extend and you can, uh, and you can deepen those conversations. Um, but, but, but I also should say, just because I'm cognizant of Rex and Hank downstairs <laughs> watching, um, you know, uh, it, it's not my view that, you um, that, uh, that everyone should parent this way and certainly not that everyone should parent this way all the time. And, uh, and, and as they've become aware of, of um, you know, I mean, they've read the book and, uh, and they've heard me tell these stories and now they're, now they're on the lookout for it. You know, I'll ask a question and, and Hank will be like, are you gonna write about this? And uh, so, uh, so you, see, you, have to, you have to be careful not to overdo it. Yeah. I, uh... I, I know I know that well. Uh, so what you're saying is that there there's a healthy dose of go the f to sleep in uh, uh, in in parenting. Oh yeah. Well, actually, one of my favorite stories about about Hank is not in the is not in the book. But uh, we spent um, uh, a semester um, uh, visiting in Boston, and we're living in an apartment where the boys were sharing a room when they were where they were very little, and uh, and they they uh, I think you know. Hank was two and Rex was five and they would keep each other up uh, way past their bedtimes. And at some point I would go into the room and say, I don't want to hear any more noise from boys. And then after months of me doing this, uh, I, I heard Hank one night at bedtime doing an impression of me, right? <laughs> St standing up in his crib and saying, I don't want to hear any more noise from boys. And then both of them uh, exploding in, uh, in wild laughter. Uh, so, so he has been mocking me since he, since he was two uh, um, for, just the, for just the issue that you're talking about. So um, part of what I loved about this is like, um, you could literally use this as a philosophy 101 textbook. Right. And, and you're I mean, like you are perfectly aware of this. Right. Uh, um, it is it's, in a lot of ways. It's the ideal philosophy 101 textbook because it it begins with an extremely relatable story. And then it expands and illuminates into a variety of philosophical principles, all of which are associated with individuals. So you're kind of learning, you know, the, the kind of footnotes on Plato along the way, so to speak. And then, it you know, closes or kind of tightens with your view. I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, like, how, how do you feel about, if you could choose one or the other, mm. somebody telling you, 
I'm using this as a philosophy 101 textbook or somebody telling you I'm using this as a parenting manual, which one would you choose? Oh, that's, that's a really great question. I do think, um, and, and it was, it was um, written, I mean, the, the topics in the book were selected organically. When I had the idea to write the book, I thought, oh, like what, what, what stories do I have about the boys? What questions have they asked? What conversations have they had? What things have they done that raise questions in philosophy that are worth thinking through? Um, you know, the, the, end re- the natural result of that, I think, is that um, you have a set of topics that you could use for an introduction to philosophy class, because as I say, kids are puzzled by the world and they're trying to sort it out and they're asking lots of the questions that, um, that philosophy is traditionally asked, right? So they're asking, what do other people owe me, right? They're asking, why, do I, why should I have to do what he said? They're asking, um, is, there, is there a God? They're asking, um, you know, um, they're asking, you know, uh, wh- wh- uh, um, we've had arguments in our house over, over like wh- whether there's truth, whether there's truth that's the same for everybody is kind of a question that Hank raised in conversation when he was eight years old. So, so just sort of following organically their interests, I've ended up with this set of 12 essays that I think really can serve as um, an introduction to philosophy. And I hope parents that are new to philosophy will experience that way, that maybe this will be a kind of engaging way of getting interested um, in these conversations. So, so that was my first choice, is maybe this is going to get adopted in, uh, uh, in philosophy 101 classes. And my second choice is maybe this will change the way that we talk to, to children. I think if I had to pick, I definitely want two rather than one um, for a couple reasons. One is, um, is I, I think people um, are really missing out on this extraordinary aspect of their children, right? Like a lot of people will pass it, will pass these moments by when a kid says something like, am I dreaming my entire life? And they'll think of this as a, like a kind of like kids say the darndest thing, like frivolous, isn't he cute kind of moment. And I really want to encourage people to see that as like something serious. It had a really sophisticated thought behind it and engage it that way partly because you should appreciate this cool aspect of your kids, partly because if you engage the conversation, it will be fun, right? And you may learn something from your kids. Gareth Matthews, this philosopher that I talked about who was super engaged with children said that philosophical conversations are kids with kids are delightful and partly partly because they can be collaborative rather than hierarchical. You're not just teaching your child something, you're trying to work out something together, something that you both find puzzling. So I think it's fun. I think it's rewarding. And then also, I think there um, could be serious returns for those kids if you nurture this inquisitiveness and this curiosity and this willingness to think things through deeply. So in much of the rest of the world, um, philosophy is a regular part of grade school education. um, And that's not been uh, true in the United States. And, And I think kids have a lot to learn, especially I'm thinking like partly in connection uh, to the book that Ibu has coming out next week. Ibu has written a really phenomenal book called We Need to Build about the, the ways in which our um, democracy is challenged at the moment and how we can try and rebuild it and especially rebuild communities in which a diverse set of people who disagree with one another deeply can engage um, respectfully and productively and find ways to live together and I think like having conversations with kids where you invite them to think about evidence and arguments and to see things from multiple perspectives, to do the kinds of things that are naturally a part of philosophy education is something that could play a role in that. So if, if you're going to make me pick, I, wanna, I want people to engage children differently. So this is true friendship, right? Because, because I, I'm, I am, I am uh, doing an author interview with Scott and there he is talking about my books. So I appreciate that. And there's actually something common in our books, which is, which is my book ends with a letter to my kids. And, and I was thinking a lot about your chapter about God and what I end with, which is a letter, a letter to my two kids in which I, 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 I write a lot about Islam and this notion of there is, an, there is a tradition that your family practices in its own way that you inherit and you are meant to do something with this inheritance, right? So, so let me develop this a little bit. So, so um, I'm sure you write about this somewhere in the book, although I, I, uh, um, uh, I maybe missed it in, in my reading, but Socrates was put to death, right? And he was put to death for the charge of corrupting the children, right? 
Uh, um, do, do you, you mentioned this somewhere, Scott, on the book? You know, I remember there was a draft that did that did mention this fact, and I can't remember if it's in the book or if it was on the cutting I mean, floor, but he dude, was that's put, to like... death for ask, put to death for asking annoying questions. <laughs> but also for corrupting the children. Am I, am and, well, that was, that was the formal charge, is by, ask, yeah. by asking these impertinent questions, you are corrupting the youth of Athens. That is the, su- that is the subtitle, if not the subtext, the subtitle, right? And, and uh, um, I mean that actually in kind of a serious way, right? Because in your God chapter, uh, Rex or Hank, and I apologize to the two boys for not remembering which one was at the center of, of this particular line of questioning, but as this profound insight, which is, which is uh, the pretend God is real. Right, I'm not getting the exact formulation yeah, right. So, so, so this was Rex when he was four years old and I was cooking dinner and, uh, and he went to the, the Jewish Community Center preschool. So he got a, a good bit of religious education there. And he had a lot of questions about the stories that he learned and about God. And one night he says, is God real? And this was not the first time we had the, the conversation. And my disposition is always, let's start this conversation by me inviting your views rather than tell you what I think. And so I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I think that for real, God is pretend and for pretend God is real. And, uh, and, and I said, wait, wait, what do you mean? And he said, well, God isn't real, but when we pretend he is. And uh, it, it, it really was, um, uh, I was struck by it in the moment and I kept thinking about it. And uh, I, don't, I like, we should, we should go back, you had a question, so we should go back to it. Yeah, but, no, but, I mean, like, like, like the, way, the way that Rex put that is tight and my kids say that, and I'm like, no, 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 no. That is that is not that is not that is not how we do. Yeah. Right. And and the thing that I'm getting at is there is a mode. You are you are advancing um, a mode of engaging with kids and philosophizing and child rearing, which is like question everything and, and not in not in a random way but in a careful rigorous way right our family practice of islam in our home is we will do the the ismaili muslim prayers at night as a family and then i will read a selection from the quran or a part of the prophet muhammad's life or a farman from the aga khan and we'll discuss it and I mean, it, you know, like I'm, you know, my kids are whatever, twelve and almost fifteen. So these last like six to ten minutes, right? Where this is, it's not like fireside chats over Muslim brandy, right? But we are engaging in a philosophical conversation, and with some regularity, like you know, my kid, one of my kids will be like, well, you know, the reason that I'm not sure I believe in God this week is that I'm like, no, 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 right? Like, there's, we can talk about lots of things. That is shook, right? Like, like that is the that is the uh, one unfor- unforgivable sin in Islam, assigning peers to God or assuming or pretending he doesn't exist. Right. The, the, the contrast that I am illuminating is w- part of what I am trying to do is pass on a tradition and to say there are things that there are things in the universe that are known and that are significant. And I hand you those things. We have stewarded those things as a family and as a community across generations and centuries. I hand them to you. You will do different things with them. We are flexible in our Muslim interpretation and practice. I have a lot of respect for people who are, who are not like us, but we are flexible in our Muslim interpretation and practice. But I'm handing my kids something substantive and I expect them to do something with that. I'm curious how you think about an approach in which Rex could say, you know, God is for real pretend and for pretend real, or, you know, Rex could say, hey, listen, I want to go from, from dad's version of Judaism to an Orthodox version of Judaism. And you think to yourself, that's actually the inheritance that I'm passing on, or, or I'm proud that they're, ta- they're, they're running with that inheritance. I'm not being as tight as I want to be with the question, but I think you understand. No, uh, I totally get, I totally get what you're getting at. And I think it raises um, a, a kind of like, uh, sort of an interesting sort of uh, comparative religion kind of question, which is to say, um, it may be that I've got what's in some ways a distinctively Jewish outlook on on some of these issues and maybe on this aspect of parenting because Judaism is not a religion that demands 
a belief, or at least not um, not first and foremost. It's a religion that um, that is uh, more interested in uh, in your actions than your uh, than your attitudes towards God, and, and that invites questioning and challenging God in a variety of ways. And so I think that it may be having grown up in that tradition myself. Um, it, uh, it makes it more comfortable for me to ask my kid in these contexts what he thinks, um, rather than, um, rather than uh, insist, or right, not insist is the wrong word, but rather than um, to, assert my, uh, to assert my views um, first and foremost. I do think um, that in the, in the long run, that um, uh, what I care about is that, um, that my kids engage these deep questions about the world and arrive at their own views about them. And if their own views take them in a direction that's more religiously observant than mine, then, um, then that will be, that will be a, a, a wonderful path for them if it's one that they, um, that they endorse on reflection. And also uh, the same is true uh, if it moves in the, in the other direction. I think there's, um, there's a moment in the chapter on God where I say, look, I, I admire um, people who um, have faith and orient their lives around God. Um, it's in some ways the opposite of the orientation that I've adopted, right? Which is to say, I think of myself as a person who questions things and wants to understand them and would rather um, puzzle over the mystery than, um, than just decide right, to, um, to proceed as if, um, as if there's truth. I thought it was really striking the way you described your faith, right? Um, I, when you said, there are things that are known and I'm passing these things on to you. Um, I, you know, I, um, I strike, striking in the following way that, um, that I asserting that, like the truths, right, that your tradition teaches are known um, seems from where I sit um, uh, to way overextend the evidence that we've got in the world and maybe to say something about which we're skeptical, right? But then there's this, but, but I know that you're sitting in an entirely different place where you've made what philosophers sometimes call the leap of faith, right? Where the choice is not to say, do I have like, you know, ironclad evidence for this, but to say, like this is like the stance I'm taking towards the world and it's how I'm gonna live my life and I value um, the way that I do. And I think that's- Well, we're not super different, right? Like uh, uh, in, in, so part, I, in, in a sense, I'm, I'm making a point as a, I'm raising a question as a parent and not as kind of a fellow intellectual, right? Like, you know, I, I'm a pretty committed Muslim but I'm, I'm perfectly aware and I, I don't think it's, I don't think arguments about the existence of God are, into, are dangerous. I think that they're interesting. And, you know, like I'm not offended. Why is it dangerous for your kid to raise the argument? Because, because um, I am passing on a tradition and you are passing on a tradition. And there's a reason you, you go to a synagogue, whether it's Hebrew or English, there's a reason your kids go to, to the JCC. And there are real dangers in kids not having traditions. Right. I, I agree with that last bit. You know, as I, I, I try to explain the God chapter, my religious, my membership in my religious community and my participation in religious practices, fasting on Yom Kippur and, um, you know, my children having bar mitzvahs, observing Passover and on and on. It, it's, it's important in my life. Um, it's important in my life because it's been um, like a rich source of meaning for me and many people in my lives. And I want my kids to have um, that sort of connection um, to community. It's important because I admire a lot of the ethical teachings that are embedded and conveyed um, through um, these, um, like th through the stories and through the holidays and through practices. And because um, regardless of, of what choices, like another sadder reason, regardless of what choices my kids make in the world about how, the, how they see themselves, um, the world will see them as Jewish. And, and I want them to, um, to know what that means and to appreciate the, the history that comes with that, both positive and, and negative. So I do, I do share that view with you, that it's important for me to convey a tradition. I just, I just don't think that it's off, in the way that I want to convey it, I don't think it's off limits to question, uh, to question that tradition or even to question its value. 
Yeah. So, I mean, just as, as like, I don't, you're doing like nine interviews a day and I'm like impressed by how intellectually just acute you are and lively you are at the, at the end of one of those days. I got one more question from me and then there's a bunch of super smart questions in the Q&A, uh, which I might actually turn it over to our hosts to, to ask because that, that's, the, that's the practice of this bookstore. My man, Frankie Fredericks has called me Dr. Patel in the Q&A. He never calls me Dr. Patel. He must be super impressed by you. All right, here's my last question. Um, uh, so I remember being at your house a couple of years ago as you were either starting the book or considering this, right? And um, you said something along the lines of like, I, I may or may not be with, I, you know, I, I may not be Wittgenstein, right? But I think that I have, by which you meant, you know, um, uh, I may not be a once in a century philosopher, right? But I think that I have a way of talking about philosophy that's super accessible and that tells stories, which people remember and illuminates and expands upon principles that are important and that have been talk about, talked about for centuries, right? And I'm reading this book, I'm like, yeah. I mean, like I've known that for a long time, right? I've known that for a long time because of our friendship uh, uh, and because of the number of times you beat me in, an argue, in arguments. Um, but this book accomplishes that. And I want to ask a question about Scott Hershowitz, the writer, you know, this is the, the, the famous line, I don't remember if it was Justice Leonard Hand or, or Oliver Wonder Holmes, but, but this, you know, I wouldn't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I'd give everything for the simplicity on that side of complexity. This is the simplicity on that side of complexity, right? Like, like I remember you writing about race and, and you're like, you know, lots of people question what race is, blah, 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 right? And you go through this very clearly and then you say, listen, Black people who have to sit, are the people who have to sit in the back of the bus during Jim Crow and white people are the ones who don't. The white people are the ones who put up there. And I'm like, that is the beginning and the end, right? Like that, that is, it's just a smart, clear three sentence way of putting it. Could you have written this book 10 years ago? Assume of course that Rex and Hank, you know, like go assume that their ages kind of transferred. Did, had you, did you have the kind of writerly chops to have written such a simple, clear book about a set of complex topics 10 years ago? So the first thing I wanna say is like, uh, uh, thank you. I mean, you're, uh, you're over the top uh, complimentary uh, about the writing and I'm really appreciative. I, mean, I do sometimes feel like I've led this life where I'm the, like the forest gump of philosophy that I just find myself in situations at Oxford, at Michigan, and other places where um, you know I get to be the student of or colleagues with uh, people who are are just extraordinary uh, thinkers, and I've always felt uh, felt blessed for that. Um, and uh, and uh, and and I think that you know what you remember me saying is is spot on. Uh, you know I think that like to the extent that um, that uh, that. I have an uncommon ability in philosophy. It's it's not uh, it's frequently at like the cutting edge of the field. It's just um, to to take the insights right that um, that other people have had sometimes, and maybe to be able to package them with a story and um, and make them easier to process and understand. I don't think I could have written the book ten years ago, not just because my kids were too little and I didn't have enough uh, enough material yet, but uh, but because you know like academic writing. Um, uh, you know, is um, like pushes you in a direction that often makes things inaccessible. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, philosophers as a group have one extraordinary virtue, which is that their writing is clear, right? Um, and, or at least uh, analytic philosophers have this virtue. You, you can always see just how the argument works and you can always, that makes it easy, easy to spot the problems with the argument, but they're, um, they're off, they often write in ways that are, are very abstract and, uh, and highly formal and, and really complex. And so partly just through my, my teaching, you know, constantly trying to think, is there a way to, um, to invite somebody into this who maybe um, would have had difficulty fo like, uh, following what they read? Can I make it simple and easy to engage and then take them back to the more complicated material? I think it's a skill that, um, that I've had to cultivate over time, and really the only way is 
is practice. I'm I'm a I'm a slow writer because the the first the first draft does not come out uh, uh, as as simple as as hopefully the last draft does. Well, I mean, it's just the book is a joy to read, and it begins in such a like a laugh out loud way, right? And and you use you use cuss words poetically and strategically, which I greatly appreciate. I think we might have improved each other's practice at that in the year or two we lived together. So I'm going to turn it over to to the good folks at Literati. As I said, it's their practice to kind of host the Q and A. Uh, uh, but I'm grateful for our friendship. I'm grateful for your work in the world, and I look forward to you know, more Oxford reunions. It's good to see Scott Weiner and, and Patrick and, and hopefully Mary's there on that Zoom and, and, and other folks uh, on this and David Ullman, who was my neighbor uh, um, at that little town in Michigan for a while there. And uh, thanks to the IFYC, the Interfaith America IFYC folks who joined, Abdul Malik Ryan and Frank Fredericks. And, and over to you, John. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. This was really wonderful. And please feel free to, to, to weigh in on, on any of these questions, too. I think that they're, they're open-ended enough that, that I think both you are and, and Scott. Yeah, Ibu, keep, keep your camera on and stay a part of the conversation if you can. Expertise is, is welcome. Um, so uh, Luke Schaefer, our first question is from Luke Schaefer, who asks, Michael Schaefer wants to know why philosophers use so many metaphors. Ah, so uh, Michael Schaefer, uh, just thrilled that Michael is here. Michael is, uh, is eight years old, nine years old. And uh, and you also just think, Michael, let's just think about what, what a metaphor is, right? A metaphor involves comparing like something like one thing to another thing, right? So, um, you know, wh when we say uh, um, uh, I I'm, ha I'm having the problem when you want, want an example of something, suddenly all the examples of it flee your mind. But wait a minute, I just use a metaphor, right? I said that when I needed to remember something, it would flee my mind kind of in like in the way that like a bird might fly away, right? So why do philosophers use metaphors? They use them because they're trying to introduce people to new ideas or make complicated ideas more simple. And so telling a story, like imagining that the ideas are in my mind and then flying out is just a way of making them more easy to grasp. Thanks, Michael. I'll ask a, a couple more short ones here. Then there, there, are, there are a couple questions in here that kind of get to the heart of um, uh, what you and, and Ibu were talking about um, in, in your conversation. So, uh, but um, Gabriel asks, um, how do you feel about the impact of influencer culture and device dependence in children? Oh, that's a really uh, like an active topic of conversation around this house because the, the device dependence of the adults right, uh, is just as big um, a problem as the device uh, dependence of our children. So, uh, you know, so we're, uh, Rex, our oldest, uh, now for the first time, uh, has a phone and, and Hank, Hank hopes to have one uh, before too long, but, but their parents are often setting bad examples, pulling out, uh, pulling out the phone when we could be having a conversation. Uh, you know, and, and of course, the, like lots of people have advice about rules about that, and I, and I and I won't purport to be an expert. We haven't settled on on good practices. I um, you know, and I don't I don't know that I have anything um, uh, you know, uh, profound to say about this, but I do worry that um, you know, like hot takes, tweaks, like the short interactions are replacing deep kind of thought. And so um, what I uh, hope for my kids, right, is not that we'll keep them off their devices entirely because there's a reason that these devices are engaging and they actually provide a kind of social connection. That's definitely been true uh, during the pandemic, but that we can keep them engaged in books, right? Um, and, uh, and in other activities that will lead to deeper questions and deeper conversations. So let me let me jump in here because I I, I was struck I was struck by all these questions, but that one in particular, I'm, I'm not sure that is that is only about de dependence on devices, right? So so I mean the the sub the, the subline to that question was parent co-parenting with Cardi B, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm as attached to, to my phone as my 14, almost 15 year old. And and when I yell at him to get off his phone, which is like six times an hour, he's like, You're always on your phone. I'm like, I'm reading the New York Times, you're watching idiot shit on TikTok right? There is a difference, right? There is a difference. 
and 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 I think that this is an int interesting and important thing to bring up philosophically. Like, like, is there a way in which hyper shallow the hyper shallow culture that is fed to our kids through algorithms actually debases philosophical conversations? That's what I took by co-parenting with Cardi B. Yeah, I mean, so I guess it's possible that it debases them. It's possible that it also just displaces them. Um, and I think I've been more worry, more focused on the, the second worry. Although, you know, uh, uh, Penguin has been pushing me uh, to think about like, how, how could you use TikTok, right? To get the word out about the book. And, and I've been somewhat reluctant because I, you know, I've been trying to think like, what I want people to do is like, um, engage these stories, engage these arguments to think deeply about these questions. And there may be a way, right, to uh, inspire people to do that through the 30 or 40 uh, second video. And actually, like, I've got some ideas that may, like maybe my kids, uh, you know, that uh, there'll be there'll be a feature in The Guardian in a couple of weeks. The Guardian had kids um, submit philosophy questions and they're really phenomenal. They're going to run answers uh, that my kids helped me with in a couple of weeks. And I thought like, oh, maybe we could like hop online and my kids and I could try and answer these questions uh, together. And then maybe it would be a, maybe it would be like something that would be a launching point for other people to, to think deeply about them. But I do think there's some activities that just take time and, uh, and philosophy is one of them. Uh, this question here um, from uh, Patrick who writes, hi Scott and Ibu, wonderful conversation. I read recently probably from Scott, that kids naturally ask these deep questions when they're young, but stop around age nine and 10. Do you know what is responsible for that tapering? Can practice, like you've been engaged in, keep them wondering about the big questions? Yeah, so the, the research here um, was done mostly by a philosopher named Gareth Matthews, who, like me, had these early experiences with his children where he was really struck by the philosophical questions that they were asking, and it took his career in a new direction. He started to uh, visit schools and, uh, and talk to parents. Um, and in the schools, he would, he would read kids stories that raise philosophical questions and have conversations with them. And what he found over decades of talking to children was they were spontaneously raising questions in philosophy, say between age three or eight. And then around nine or 10, they would do it less on their own. Um, he found that you could still prompt philosophical conversations and they get really engaged in them, but, uh, but it wasn't coming up naturally so often. He had um, some speculation about why this is and, um, and I agree with, with much of it. I think it's a few things. One is I think the littlest kids are the kids that are struggling most to make sense of the world, right? So they're, they're most apt to be um, asking the profound questions, challenging things grownups take for granted because they don't know what the standard way of thinking about them is, right? They don't yet know what people take for, for granted. And as you like are acculturated and you come to, um, you come just to accept maybe unthinkingly that this is how it is, my teacher gets to tell me what to do, right? You just stop asking the question. I think that's one kind of reason. I think the second um, really uh, important reason is that little kids don't have a strong sense of, or, or, or much interest in or concern with what other people are thinking about them. So they're not worried that the kinds of questions they're asking might seem silly. They're not worried that the answers they're giving might be wrong and obviously so. So they have a kind of fearlessness, right? If Rex had come up with the argument about the size of the universe when he was 12 or 14, I'm not sure he would have you know, said it to me on the way home from school. He might've started by Googling it to see if it was right, or or he might have just kept it to kept it to himself. So I think like the lack of concern with what other people think is probably a significant part of it. And then of course, like there's all kinds of ways in which your world expands as you age, right? And you take on new interests and new activities. You're you're you know spending more time on your homework or on your athletic endeavors. Um, uh, you know your social life changes, and I'm and I'm sure that contributes to to some of it too. Oh, the second bit of this, can, can you continue it? I, I think totally, right? You know, I said my kids are a little bit skeptical of me now because they know what I'm up to. Um, but, but even still, even with, uh, with their resistance, if you catch them at the right moment, if you ask the question in the right way, 
they get they get really absorbed. And actually, we dropped in Literati yesterday just to, to snap a picture of the of the book, like as a real thing in the world and on sale. And and Rex and I picked up another philosophy book uh, to take home. Uh, and uh, and he just told me at dinner tonight that uh, he's got to write a book report. He's going to read. He's going he's gonna to read that. He's going to read that book and write his uh, write his report about it. So uh, I think I think you can absolutely continue these conversations with kids. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of really incredible meaty questions in here. So my apologies in advance to our viewers if, if we do not get to all of them. I'll in, start in answering the hour. more quickly. Uh, no, no, no worries. Um, Fr Frank writes, uh, as a build on Dr. Patel's question, as a parent, kids are four years and eight months. While I personally identify with questioning everything and embracing uncertainty, I've seen child development research that suggests that child learning, a child learning slash holding certainty in beliefs tends to correlate with better outcomes. Put more practically, I've been personally and constructively challenged by not only the religious depth of Tolstoy and the kingdom of God is within, within you, excuse me, but also Albert Camus and the Sisyphus. But I can see myself talking about Tolstoy with my kids long before Camus. In what way can superficial certainty be fruitful over the messy middle that might better reflect our realities? Yeah, so um, I'm not familiar with, with the, the research the question is alluding to that suggests that, um, that, that certainty leads to better outcomes. And I'm kind of curious about to know what, the, what outcomes are being measured and just what the certainty is, um, is about. So I think there are things I absolutely want my kids to be certain about. I want them uh, to be certain that we love them um, and that we support them and that we value them. Um, and, you know, and I talk about in the punishment chapter about the, um, you know, putting Hank to bed one night uh, after he'd, he'd, he'd misbehaved and he'd lost his ability to play Minecraft the next day. And he was a little bit distraught about that. And, uh, and I didn't want him to go to sleep distraught. You know, I didn't want to change the, the consequence, but I, but I wanted to, to assert that like, we love you and you're a member of this family and you always will be. So there are some things that I think are just fixed that I want them to know and understand about their place in the world. But, uh, but I also don't want to put anything off limits and say that um, there are questions that can't be asked, right? Um, there, there are things that can't be, that can't be challenged. So, um, uh, you know, certainty about the love and, uh, and everything else is up for grabs. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more question. There's, there's one from, from Richard that I'd like to get to. Um, he writes, hey, Scott, I'm enjoying the book a lot. You talked about the boys asking whether you would write about something. I'm wondering to what extent, if any, you found that the fact of your writing the book affected their conversations with you, what topics they would raise, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I think that's in different ways over time. So, um, you know, now as, uh, as they, uh, Rex is an adolescent and Hank is, Hank is on his way there and they've got like more awareness of, of the book and that there are characters in the world and characters in these uh, stories, as I say, like they, they, they are definitely viewing themselves with a third person perspective. And, um, uh, and actually, you know, uh, maybe reluctant to, engage directly in philosophical conversations with me sometimes. Although when these questions came in uh, from other kids uh, that the Guardian had solicited, um, both boys just had a blast, right? Uh, thinking through what they would wanna say to these kids. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so, uh, so they're still um, engaged and interested and have lots of views and arguments of, of their own. Um, but I, but I think like, you know, earlier on, like when the, when the idea for the book first came up, the, the boys have been from the start, uh, super enthusiastic. They love hearing these old stories about themselves. They, they love revisiting the issues. Like one of the, one of the things I think is cool about the book is in various chapters, they're markers of the views, uh, the, the, the boys views changing across time. Right. So you see like, uh, Rex didn't always, always hold on to his view that for real God is pretend and for pretend God is real. He arrived at a much more skeptical um, picture as he as he got older. And uh, we revisit other other things, questions about uh, skepticism and knowledge at different points. And he had different views about that, too. 
Um, so, uh, so it's been fun, right, to see their uh, to see their perspectives change over time. Thank you. Um, we've reached the top of the hour. Scott Herjavitz, Ibu Batel. Can thank I you. just say real quick? Oh I yeah, just sure. Say, yeah, um, you know, Patrick is on here. Scott Weiner's on here. And we just had an incredible group of friends at, at, at uh, in grad school, and it's it's unfair. Like it's unfair uh, because they were the nicest people, but they also just you know like you couldn't you couldn't have a lazy argument because they would, they would just, they would murder it in front of you, you know? So you just, you just had to be that much sharper. Uh, um, and it's, I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful for that time. And, and Scott publishing this book is an opportunity to like re-engage even if virtually and hopefully soon enough in person, but it is so much fun. You know, look, John Courtney Murray once said, civilization is living and talking together right? Like that's literally what a civilization is. And, and, and we had that, uh, and Scott's book is an opportunity to like engage in that in the most profound way. So thanks to everybody who was a part of that community. So I will, I will second Ibu's thanks to that group. And I'll just say, like, I see in the participant list, people from, uh, the philosophy department and the law school and friends from around Ann Arbor and friends and family, uh, from other places. And, um, and all of those folks have, have shaped who I am and who my kids are over the course of conversations. And I'm so appreciative and appreciative to Ibu for having such, uh, such great questions and generosity. And Ibu's book is awesome. Uh, it's called, We Need to Build, and you should buy that, you should buy that book too. There's a link to, to pre-order We Need to Build um, in, the, in the chat. And there's also, if you're watching us on YouTube, there's links to purchase Nasty Brutish in short and to pre-order We Need to Build, which comes out on May 10th from Literati Bookstore um, in the description below. Um, Scott and Ibu, thank you so much for joining us tonight on At Home with Literati. It's, it's a pleasure to have you both. Hopefully we can have you both in this store. Thank you to our viewers. Thank you for your questions. We could spend uh, hours on these questions, which is why they're, you know, I wish we had three hour block here um, to, to sort of sop up all this brilliance, but um, I'll have to save it for another time, but, but thank you both. And, and to our viewers, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great evening, everybody. Take care. Thanks so much, John.